Ilya Ponomarenko is a Ukrainian journalist, war reporter, and defense analyst, formerly writing for the Kiev Independent. In January 2023, given his prominent role in reporting for the conflict, he was described by Der Spiegel as likely the best-known Ukrainian after President Volodymyr Zelensky. He's written an account of his experiences reporting on the war. I will show you how it was, the story of wartime Kiev, and that is to be released in August 2024. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like, subscribe, and definitely comment on the videos to help people discover the fantastic guests who've given their time to get the message about Ukraine across. Please also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. It's incredibly important to support Ukraine and Ukrainians in their resistance against Russian aggression at this time. Ilya, welcome to the channel. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, you've written this extraordinary book, uh, and it goes without saying, I strongly recommend everyone watching this channel to go out, buy it, read it, and really immerse themselves in it. Um, I'm going to ask the, the obvious question here about your motivations and the experience of writing the book, because you know, you've immersed yourself in the reporting from day one. I'm assuming a lot of the stuff you've seen is, is difficult, even traumatic. Um, so... How does that relate to the process of writing the book? Did it bring back a lot of those initial impressions? I decided to write a book, particularly about the Battle of Kiev, uh, closer to the end of 2022, um, because I've been thinking about this for quite a long time, since the basically the end of the Battle of Kiev. And I decided to do this uh, because the Battle of Kiev and what happened in early 2022 uh, was so surprising to me, such a milestone in my perception in um, modern history, such an unexpected, miraculous victory in many ways, a man-made miracle against so many odds, against such a dark expectations as half of the world, as you remember, was just burning Ukraine alive. And... Uh, that was an event of history that we witnessed from inside and in, in which we in many ways participated to. And it was such an incredible act of human bravery, enthusiasm, courage, um, good faith also, good hope, uh, that it essentially turned history, changed the course of, of history against so many expectations of Russia lost. Um, and this, these events, those days, uh, left such a heavy imprint on me that I just couldn't find any better topic for me to talk about. But initially, I wanted this to be um, probably the first one or one of the first uh, books in terms of you know military history of those days. You know, maps, arrows, fancy military terms, but. Um, Later, I decided that there are people who are much more better that, uh, at this than me. And uh, I have really something else to tell, um, especially when it comes to Western audience. You know, the feelings, the personal experience behind these things, behind a very incredible event in, in modern European history that we have a capital of a city that's being um, attacked, almost uh, encircled in an attempt to destroy entire country. And uh, this was supposed to be an apocalypse that never happened because of so many people, regular people just look like you and me, doing what they should do, uh, believing in what is right and doing what is right. So that was... Up to this day, it's such a moment of hope for me up to this day that I decided that I need to do this and I need to have a very sincere and personal conversation with the reader about this. Not those military maps and, and arrows and you know analysis, but something you know humane, something that is close to any human being, you know, emotions, you know, what what's as at stake, what is like to be in the middle of that apocalypse that was decided upon us because such things they are the end of so many things that we in normal peaceful life have 
but often we don't appreciate them to the full extent. You know, the quiet happiness of of um, of you know having lunch with your family, you know, getting back um, from from work and going to bed, absolutely being one one hundred percent sure about the next day that tomorrow will come. And and there'll be a peaceful day, just usual. In general, you know, the this happiness of having peace and si a silent life and quiet life and you know joyful life. And uh, when it comes to the uh, gathering storm of war with death army gathering across your capital city and essentially spelling the ends of this decade of reforms in Ukraine following the Euromaidan revolution and you know, the entire epoch which my generation fought for to make this country a better place mm -hmm. that's definitely quite a quite an emotion and uh, you know from day one uh, sometimes uh, without any purpose just because of personal intuition and uh, I was not alone in this but we in Ukraine we in many ways relied on something more than just you know reporting headlines and talking about these things but also to talk with our audience as human beings, uh, to be as humane and as lively as possible so that we can um, reach out to so many minds and hearts in the West and to, you know, <sighs> get more supporters and to explain more people what it is that's happening and why supporting Ukraine and helping Ukraine deal with this is so important. So I decided to do this. And, you know, in many ways, um, uh, you know, I'm on journalists. There's a this like a golden rule that saying that you are not the story, you are not the story. So it's not about you; it's about the people that you see. And in many ways, my book is not is not definitely not about me, not about myself. It's just about regular people that I saw with my own eyes, incredible people, incredible things that we saw with my own eyes. And it's a sincere, uh, very honest, um, imperfect conversation emotional conversation sometimes emotional conversation a sincere conversation with uh friends in your audience from a guy who was among so many millions of ukrainians trapped in this who did what he could and what he should in those days and who also happened to be um a journalist in those days so that's a kind a, a tale from one guy from one ukrainian guy uh, I think from um, my experience, that was the best thing that I could tell about those days. I don't think that I would <laughs> get a very good military history book. Yeah. And there are, there are plenty of those. There are plenty of YouTube channels which, you know, analyze the day-by-day -day changes in the front line. I think what you've brought to this is is unique and very important. And you've described it as an unscripted Ukrainian victory, almost unplanned in some ways. On the other hand, this victory couldn't have happened without, you say, the involvement of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians really pulling in the same direction, fighting for the same thing. Um, you know, whether they are on the left or the right of politics, however they define themselves in terms of their personal or political identity, there's a commonality of purpose that comes across. How important do you think that was and how important that people had a, a common sense of defending uh, the Maidan values and defending all the changes that had happened in the previous sort of revolutions and upheavals that Ukraine has experienced over 30 years. This is actually the central topic and the central message of the book. Um, believe in what was right, believe in what is right, having good faith and acting and doing what needs to be done with with little to no hope, but with good faith about what's happening and our role in this and uh, going the hard way, as we call it. You know, this very basic and simple moral principle that sometimes people forget about in our days, in our lives. This is the central, actually the central message behind this book is that, is that you know hard choices and having good faith about complicated and hard things they play out this is the way we came to what we have right now here in ukraine to more than two years since those days and since the victory at kiev 
So that was the central message. And moreover, what was generally shocking to me in many positive ways that it was about so many people from very regular, absolutely regular people, even beyond the military community, but also about uh, top tier politicians, including people like Vladimir Zelensky, in many ways. You know what? Sometimes people say that war really shows uh, a human being's true nature. You know, everybody reveals their true self in the war. Um, and uh, what I saw in many of my friends, of my personal friends from my life, and what I saw from people like Zelensky, and uh, I, I've I've always been critical of Zelensky about his character, personality, about his attitude towards his his uh, presidency but when the time came he became what he is he became um absolutely a different personality because he was this way all this time and uh, this touches upon so many people who were for instance i know radio hosts and i have this episode in my book but 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 decided to join um uh, home guard units um, that had little to no weapons, had to, you know, get their own clothes and garments for, for, for fighting, for, you know, participating in the city defense. But nonetheless, they were doing this. Uh, it's about this insane enthusiasm and the uh, enthusiasm of the doomed. Um, like, you know, a top hip hop star in Ukraine, in the middle of Kiev, in, in downtown Kiev, singing songs with a rifle in his hands because he joined patrol units police patrol units and he's a top tier um hip hop star singing loud and you know and all these videos they make it to the internet and more and more people see this so it's the sense of unity in inspiration you know, but to me <clears throat> uh, when it comes to this particular aspect to me the top moment came um i think it was from february 25th the day to when so many regular people in uh, Kiev's district of Balon, this is the northern part of Kiev, uh, there was a video that went viral on the internet and uh, it was showing regular people getting their rifles from police. I know the uh, boxes full of rifles arrived uh, on trucks and very, very regular people without any you know enlistment and documents and anything and police used to deliver all those weapons to uh, to the regular people because people were getting ready to actually defend their own streets and, and you know meet up Russians and fight Russians. And you could see from this these moments you can see that for most of those people, uh, you know, that was the first moment in their life that they had a, a, a weapon in their hands. Nonetheless, so many regular people were getting weapons to fight and very probably die in the streets of their own city and they moreover did not move their weapons these weapons against let's say you know what what russia claims is to be a nazi government of ukraine or something like that and not absolutely the very regular people just like you and me who you see in the streets every single day were doing this they were ready to fight and die in their own streets to me, that was the top moment when I realized that we're going to win to this war. Russians are not going to make it. But I expected hard yeah. urban battle, but that was the moment, this the peak moment. And this is something I always refer to this, but this is um, exactly what Winston Churchill once upon a time called the finest hour. That was the finest hour. But it happened to Ukraine. You describe in... Uh very moving detail, the horror and heroism of the Battle of Kiev. But there's another side of this, of course, and this is the Russians arrive and they turn your suburbs and your cities uh, into a hellscape, a hellscape resembling Stalingrad and these historic images that we see from almost uh, 100 years ago in the 1940s. What, in your view, is it about Russia that it repeats these patterns of history, that it seems to recreate the most hellish times of its own history and European history, and seems to repeat them almost in a sort of endless loop. What was the impression you had 
when you know you started to be immersed in this Russian hellscape? Um, you know, I grew up in eastern Ukraine, in Donbass, and my hometown is you know, under Russian occupation right now. And, uh, you know, I grew up, as many people in my uh, homeland, we grew up having um, a mindset and be a mindset that is really close to what's happening in Russia. So we were, we were mentally, we, ha we have been mentally pretty close to what's happening to Russia and then, you know, the Russian narratives and all those things for decades. So I know a bit about what, what what's in the Russian brains and, and thoughts and it, you know public narrative and, and 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 authorities and and regime and so many many other things to me what we saw in um in the suburbs of kiev you know this terrible battle that was fierce from both sides that was brutal from on both sides full of emotions full of dedication from both sides um acts of cruelty too uh, so, um, to me, that was the result of everything that we saw. We've been witnessing this, but we, in many ways, ignored uh, this. You know, these decades of uh, of aggressive propaganda, these decades of absurd things happening on Russian TV, that we often fail to take seriously. This cultivation of uh, revanchism, you know, territorial grabs. This. Um, instigation of bitterness of these you know never ending um seeking for revenge uh for the in the past glory of the soviet union that ended like three years ago about this paradise lost in the soviet union a completely line conception concept and the perception but still you know human minds are plastic are very plastic you can shape them can you know give them any shape if you if you have enough resources and if you are dedicated enough, especially when you have evil intentions behind your behind your soul. Um, that was the result of um, you know this promotion of um, Russian superiority over the neighboring nations, uh, this promotion of um, Russians feeling superior to Ukrainians, particularly in Ukrainians feeling hostile towards Ukrainians. Ukrainians in many ways being something uh, something in between of being like a lost ed, um, younger brothers and subhumans who betrayed Russia. So I can talk about, about this for an hours, for hours and hours, but you know, it's been a result of uh, all this cultivation of totalitarianism, of this cult of war and, you know, and this... Uh, look you know this thirst for revenge about this so when elite russian paratroopers their units entered places like bucha so they treated local people accordingly because they are superior they came they came here to liberate you from from yourself because you are nazis and we are superior we are um Cares to the glory of the Soviet Union and the, and the victory, the blissful victory of the uh, um, of the Soviet Union in World War II. We are absolutely morally pure in this, and you are absolutely morally filthy. So you need to be purged and liberated. So that's that's the you know it's we like I said we really failed to notice this. We in many ways we absurdize all those things that we happen in. We were just thinking about you know Russian. Russians getting bonkers of their TV, but unfortunately, we greatly underestimated the effects of that when that happens for decades and when it occupies so many minds, especially when it comes to you know cultivating this aggression. So, in many ways, this happened in Bucha in Alpine, um, and uh, moreover, this effect was amplified by the Ukrainian resistance and the um, you know this inevitable coming of fear, sense of insecurity that comes to occupational troops as they face hostile um, uh, hostile resistance uh, from the um, opposing army, but also from, you know, guerrillas. And they sense the fear, they, they sense the danger from every corner, so they are not sure if that guy or girl um, is not, you know, involved in, in um, guerrilla fighting or, 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 you know, subversive activities. So it cultivates even more and more. So it becomes uh, a violent process. 
So the result is what we saw is what we saw in many many places of Kiev Oblast. Um, you know, there's been statistics, fresh statistics revealed by the police, published by the Ukrainian police. So we ended up uh, unearthing and revealing uh, close to one thousand bodies in Kiev Oblast, and uh, nearly five hundred of them were revealed here in Bucha. Because Bucha was one of the centers of um, of logistics, one of the hardest places of battle, and naturally, they it involved a lot of incidents like Russian soldiers, particularly paratrooper units, just gathering local local males of you know fit local males who were suspected of uh, uh, being territorial defense fighters and uh, brought to the corner and shot dead, executed in the place. This is what happens when you spend decades preparing an entire nation and particularly your military for territorial grabs for aggressive war. As simple as that. And how important is it that you're, you've described yourself as a Donbass boy. I assume that, uh, uh, you know, in school um, and throughout your life, uh, you know, Russian played an important role as many people uh, from Eastern Ukraine, uh, it did. Um, how important is it that, that that you become a war reporter, that you disprove the Russian propagandistic lie that somehow they're coming to save Russian speakers, save Russian culture, et cetera, and, you know, push back these uh, extremists from the West of Ukraine? How important is it that you specifically, with your background, are one of these strong voices uh, countering the Russian narrative? I'm not, I'm not you know, I, I really hope that my work uh, for all these years, it had some effect on, you know, disproving propaganda and, you know, bringing more truthful image of Ukraine, in particularly in the West, especially given the fact that, you know, I I grew up in those places, you know, I spent 24 years of my life in there, I became a personality in those places, and uh, then, only then I moved to Kiev to work, to work uh, as, as this. Um, uh, in many ways, it happened um, that I had a lot of <laughs> so-called preferences uh, among the Ukrainian military uh, when they when they got it that I am a local guy in Donbass, so I came there because they really appreciate those who um, who are not poisoned by by uh, Russian propaganda who actually understand what is about. Um, it's it was you know it's something that we don't like to talk these days about in Ukraine, but it it was never about language. You know, it's 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 a terrible simplification. It's it's absurd simplification that, for instance, people like Elon Musk they say that you know so what you know Eastern Southern Ukrainian speaks Russian, so they definitely want to be part of Russia. No, it's not this way. This doesn't work that way. It's not about language. You can speak any language you like, but you do not want to be part of that. Regime, you do not want to be uh, the life that Russians, ordinary Russians, have. Um, you do not want to grow up in that atmosphere of unfreedom that that is growing worse. You know, Russia is now is pretty as close to being a totalitarian state as as it possible. Um, it's about so many things that contradict your own um, education, your own plans for the future, your own image of uh, the country you want to live in. And on the other hand, we have Ukraine, and we are absolutely integrated into Ukrainian cultural life, Ukrainian, you know, public life. Um, we are absolutely, we're absolutely involved in things that changed today's Ukraine, like Euromaidan revolution. I was the guy, me, I was the guy who uh, launched the first rally, Euromaidan rally in Mariupol was just a handle of my friends and several university lecturers. That was me, that was I, because we believed in those values. We uh, absolutely understand the same future for this country uh, as we want. So it's not about language. It's not, it's not about um, language you prefer to talk to, uh, to, to use as, as you talk to your friends and relatives. It's about values. We want to be, and uh, you know, people in, uh, let's say in, from Kiev, you know, of our generation who grew up on these values they we we now have like a common image of what we want to have in this country so you could be as as russian speaking as you as you want but it's about your values 
Um, so that's why you very often see Russian speaking soldiers fighting, fiercely fighting, because they know what this, what this is about. And they want uh, to be part of Ukraine because they, we, we feel this as our home. We don't, we don't want any other country. Um, I hope that that really works in this. But what's what's really problematic about such things is that you know it's it's very easy to say this oversimplified statements like all oh, Russian speaking Ukrainians want to be part of Russia because they speak Russian. So what? Uh, and it's, it's it's really hard to talk about and persuade people in uh, a bit more complicated truth and realities that we are discussing right now. It's not, it's not that simple. So in other, way, in, in other words, saying propaganda, simplistic and dumb propaganda and absolute propaganda is, is, is really easy. And it's, it makes a shorter way to people's brain, to human brains. Sometimes it's harder to, um, to counter it with actual facts because life is a bit more complicated than that. But it's something that is our duty, I believe, especially in wartime. It's something that we need to do. And I, I guess we're not 100% successful in this, but we are We are doing this. Talking of that complex, nuanced truth, there are uh, independent media such as the Kiev Independent, there's Kiev Post, and there's, there's, there's other publications uh, writing in both English and Ukrainian doing a good job, I think, of reporting the detail, whether that is favorable to the Ukrainian side or not, speaking the truth seems to be a priority. How much of a challenge, however, has it been to sustain what you've described as very necessary journalism and objectivity during wartime? Oh, you know, being an a English language media outlet in Ukraine has never been easy. <laughs> Not gonna lie this to you. Um, for many years, um, Kiev Post was basically the only one, ne or a dominant one, next to several dwarfs that were not serious in many in many regards. Um, the um, coming of Euromaidan changed things a bit because, in general, the the na the entire nation. Um, got closer to Western Valley, so you know English language, to looking more uh, into foreign countries, into West, you know, moving West, and of course this amplified with the uh, uh, the gathering storm of war, of full, of full scale of war. And uh, right now, basically, I would say that yeah, we have a couple of specialized English language media outlets, Ukrainian media outlets. <clears throat> speaking English and um, and uh, most of the biggest media outlets uh, uh, here in Ukraine, they also have like a English language chapters that they try to to work with. But other than that, um, right now Ukraine is still surprisingly in the focus of attention of of all global media. So global media is still in here, very much in here. To, they do a spectacular job in in many regards that uh, we really appreciate. What's a problem is that the problem is that of course it's been a, always a, a money issue because uh, in Ukraine media uh, advertisement market is non-existent, and it's a problem not only about um, foreign language publications but also about the entire Ukrainian media market. It's really hard to be independent. It's really hard to be sustainable in terms of your funding in Ukraine. It's a big pain in in a big headache for you. Uh, I think we have maybe a couple of um, major media outlets that um, feel independent and they um, can be sure about their profitability and their sustainability without you know going and asking for money from money backs oligarchs that that never do this for free of course um so in many ways why we um called our media outlet the kiev independent which we established uh, in november 2021 shortly before the coming of war and we called this 
independent because we were absolutely fed up with uh, being dependent on a guy who gives money and who tells us what to do. Uh, which is the reason why uh, we were all sacked from the Kiev post. Uh, it's, it's, it's some sunny day, several days before the <laughs> Kiev independent was established. Um, and uh, the Kiev independent was and is um, an independent media publication because of just one reason, because of insane support from the audience. Not many um, media outlets in Ukraine. I would say that Kiev Post, Kiev, Kiev Independent, was among the uh, few ones who really can sustain from um, actual readers, from donations, from subscriptions, and uh, from public support. You know, from uh, in Ukraine, that's that's the only way to do that. And when it comes to things like objectivity and um, and the uh, um, you know sustainability of your media outlet in Ukraine, people, your only chance is to gather a lot of people um, willing to donate and to keep you afloat. And you can do that. You can get that without being honest, sincere, uh, reliable, truthful, and without people, so many people feeling this and knowing this and knowing that they can trust you. So that's the model that worked with the Kiev Independent. And this is the idea and model that works with me personally, because when I quit Kiev Independent, I started doing um, journalism of my, on my own on Twitter and uh, sometimes uh, suggesting that, you know, my audience just gives donations. If you like this, if you want to support this, it's absolutely um, beyond any you know paywalls or subscriptions or something like something like that because I do this majorly for for my country for my for my for my uh, for my duty. But if you will, if you are willing to support this, here you go. You can do this, and it really worked for me too. So uh, I keep saying this all this all this time, all this time of war that honesty, um, sincerity. And trust really works. It's the only way for you to, to gain support and to be independent. That's how it works. Nothing else works in Ukraine. I would I would say that uh, that's a fairly perhaps universal idea as well. You know, if you're beholden to uh, owners uh, of a particular media, there's always going to be a slant uh, in some ways, whether it's implied or explicit. Now, censorship in Britain during World War II was actually incredibly harsh and quite intense. Um, have you found that you have to dance around wartime censorship or, dare I say, even involvement of uh, um, you know, intelligence services? Or have you had a fairly free reign uh, as far as editorial topics covered, looking into subjects like corruption, for instance? Because, you know, what a key part of my done and the subsequent judicial and social reforms, as well as a feature of Ukrainian civic society, is the strong investigation and pushback against corruption. So how have you found the freedom to cover these kind of topics? Hand on heart, we do not have you know, the uh, sort of uh, wartime censorship that you think about as, as you think about World War II time in Britain, for instance. In many ways, it happened because uh, these are very different times that we are having right now. It's the very different model of society, very different model of, um, um, you know, media aspect and how it works, especially in the time, especially when it comes to the time of social media and uh, a Facebook page in everyone's pocket, you know, World War II style censorship just doesn't work. It's just not possible. When it comes to what we actually have is that Ukraine remains, despite war, despite wartime, it, it remains what it is, what has it has always been, a super boiling country with super violent um, public discussion, extremely emotional, extremely vibrant, like it's a boiling pot of, of Facebook posts in where everyone has an opinion. Uh, it's a very brutal in terms of um um you know domestic you know strife and fighting and just dis discussing everything 
and uh, hating on uh, politicians that you don't like and defending the politicians. It's like it's a full scale boiling pot of political life. Super emotional, just like in any sustainable, sustained democracy, especially when it comes to, you know, Ukraine, which is a country with a huge thorn in the ass, as we call it. So it can be calmed. Um, so because of this nature, it's it's really hard to conceal something. It's really hard to um, to, to um, for authorities to put pressure upon journalists because, like I said, it's it's always an explosion of emotions on Facebook. Um, sometimes we refer to our country as um, what's the word for this? It's like a Facebook cockracy something like that so it's it's a country ruled by opinion leaders and you know thousands of likes on on facebook so but the public discussion in in ukraine is extremely uh, extremely volatile what we have in ukraine is that for instance when it comes to um corruption we really have an outbreak of um um, corruption, anti-corruption investigations in in in, uh, in when it comes to the military, when it comes to uh, security forces too. So there has been a upsurge of this. Uh, Ukrainian journalists has always been strong in terms of you know anti-corruption uh, investigations. We have several very strong uh, media outlets do this, but right now it's even more uh, even more important even more and, and it gets as much emotions uh, and as as much attention from general audiences than before because it's wartime. Um, as, was, as an illustration of what we have in Ukraine, you know, the other days you might remember, we actually dethroned a defense minister for following a corruption scandal because of procurement, food procurement in the military, following insane scandals the defense minister was dethroned. Um, it's not, the reason it could, Alex, the reason yep, could, yeah. Yep. Um, no one, uh, defense minister Reznikov, the former, former defense minister, that was in many ways tip of the iceberg behind the whole the whole thing. But And uh, Minister Reznikov has, has had his positive sides and his, he has done a lot. But nonetheless, though that was the effect of of insane scandals that follow journalistic investigations, uh, which is something, and in you know, the corruption in defense ministry, in military procurement, is absolutely something that we cannot tolerate, especially in wartime, especially in time of war against Russia. Um, another thing is that um, sometimes when you work as a journalist, it's it's not simply about things like military officials telling us what to write or what not to write. It's about lots of bureaucracy. It's about lots of, uh, and not intended um, omission of authorities. And not because they really want to conceal you something from you, but sometimes, you know, most of the military officials and, bu and bureaucrats are not competent and not interested in, in their work. So it's more, more about this thing. Another thing is that we in Ukraine uh, recently had a massive scandal uh, with um, uh, SBU uh, security force, it's the internal security um, um, security agency, and it was revealed that a certain um, department uh, of, of of the SBU, which was responsible for um, the protection of nationhood and something like that, you know, something like that, it actually spied on uh, journalists on uh, investigation project Vihus Info, and they revealed a shocking revelation that uh, their camera specialists during their Christmas time vacation smoked pot somewhere following their meeting. And that was just, you know, a lot of outbreak, a lot of anger, but not because of their cameraman. Um, no, camera girls, I guess, smoking pot, but about, you know, the security agencies spying on journalists, on cam camera camera people of journalists who do investigations. That was massive scandal, lots of anger in Ukraine. And uh, in the end of this, you know, these guys, these investigators, they investigated the whole thing. They absolutely unwilled the, the way and the 
absolutely hilarious story of how 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 the SBU people were spying on them and what they did on Christmas time, you know, during um in some sort of a resort in the woods, not far away from this place, by the way, in Bucha. That was a hilarious story, but nonetheless, that was a massive scandal about this. So, you know, in general, Ukraine for the last decade or in general, you know, it's it's the the entire decade, the entire period and decades of uh, Ukrainian independence was always about this struggle within. Ukraine is always in the struggle between from out, from one side, journalists, activists, um, um, you know, um, you know, good-hearted officials. And those who advocate reforms and and uh, and promote um, westernization, promote reforms, uh, combat corruption. And from other sides, we have corrupt officials. We have uh, officials who abuse their power. Uh, we have also so many things that make us similar to Russia and who drag us back to being similar to Russia and who drag us back to those times. So it's always uh, an insane battle. There's been you know it's um, it's it has always been this way and it's still now uh in in war time so it's not about censorship that you think about it's about ukraine still fighting not war against not only the war against you know foreign invaders but also you know really fighting hard to make this make itself a better place that's process of de-russification to an extent, which is a decades-long process. Uh, that's fascinating. But you mentioned Western reporting, and you, you put it in a very positive light. Um, if I could perhaps sort of uh, throw at you some concerns there, though, because there is some fantastic reporting, and there's some fantastic individual reporters and analysts, absolutely, no question. But if we take the mainstream Western media, it seems to me that there are a number of problems one is the depth and frequency of coverage, the fact that actually very important things are happening, but they get only cursory mentions in the Western press, uh, including many of Ukraine's successes over the last couple of months around the Black Sea and, of course, in targeting Russian oil facilities. There also seems to be problematic reporting, which comes from a number of different failings. Um, but a classic example of that is around the Kohovka Dam, Absolutely dreadful reporting, almost across the board in the West, I would say, um, failing essentially to look at any of the information or circumstantial evidence that, that Russia had intentionally uh, you know, caused that uh, um, ecological disaster, uh, but, but just generally extremely poor reporting. And then when evidence does come to light, there's no kind of prominent follow-up to try to reset the record. If you're going to put a, a hypercritical cap on, what would you say is the gaps and failings of Western reporting during this war? You know, in general, just just I'm expressing nothing but my opinion. In general, I think the uh, Russian full-scale war is, in many ways, was the illustration of why we still need journalism, why journalism matters, and why it actually works not to entertain you know people with news or something like that but it actually works to hopefully resolve the evils of this world hand on heart i believe what we saw particularly during the battle of kiev with so many western journalists working in here basically the top tier media all being in, in there next to us on battlefields and in the city i think the Western reporting did their best job. It was possible. That was possible. In general, you know, journal journalism, particularly Western journalism, just in many ways proved itself. It was one of the best cases for Western journalism in um in its history. When it comes to things like Western reports, you know. Places like Bucha, in many ways, what we know about Bucha, what the all the amount of the, of, of uh, everything that tells us what happened here, undeniable evidence of what was happening, from satellite pictures to you know drone footage that's 
um, verified under astronomical <laughs> astronomical um, um, uh, astronomical features that absolutely prove the genuinity of of, of these videos showing Russian authorities authorities and um, showing the result of Russian presence in here. That was in many ways down to the videos of actually Russian troops killing people in there from security cameras. That was the work from, for instance, the New York Times. Uh, one of the best pieces of journalism ever seen um, by anyone. And on, one, and on one of the most important topics that could, could be in our time. But at the same time, you know, New York Times has gained a bit of notoriety. <laughs> let's let's go a soft way uh, with weird takes and weird opinions about Ukraine and about Ukrainian matters and being wrong <laughs> sometimes in this. But um, I would say that it's... Uh, these things in this like it's extremely naive and hypocritical reporting on on the Ukrainian or oversimplification or something that we feel is extremely irrelevant narratives about Ukraine. I think it could be described more about more like you know the um, benefits and pains of of democracy because you know there are lots of voices there are lots of people are different. Let's start this way. Are we all humans? People are different, you know, lots of voices, lots of reasons, lots of points of view on this, um, very different patterns of experience, when, especially when it comes to, you know, knowing what Ukrainian is and, uh, and understanding the Ukrainian context and seeing what's relevant and what's not. Um, the pain, <laughs> the uh, pain of that is that, yes, People are different, and uh, you can't say no to all those people in, in their right to publish to you know publish this or that. So you can't simply you know dictate what 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 to what's to be reported and, and what is not. But the good side of this is that um, at the same time, this freedom, this ex freedom of expression, this um, competition of ideas, I would say, uh, gives more resources gives more intention to stronger voices to more professional journalists and you know you can't you know you can't get a good journalism in a totalitarian state that dictates you know what to think about and the way people will need to think about so the only way to to have a strong journalism is to put it in the environment of freedom and yes yeah, sometimes there will be things that are stupid. Sometimes there will be things that you feel irrelevant and weak, uh, but that, that's the negative side. But the good side of this, which, which we described in the absolute terrific Western investigations of Bucha that absolutely would leave no doubts about Russian role and Russian killings and what, what's happening, and about death of all those people that we found in mass graves and we as we entered uh, Bucha. That's the good side of this, and it really prevails over the bad side of this model. So we are where we are now. And your book helps, I think, to address this as well. It adds an extra layer of impression, uh, a, a real emotional and and visceral connections to the events which sometimes reporting doesn't quite get across or people aren't in the right frame of mind so i think your book's incredibly important to sort of add on to that reporting but it does lead me to ask and this is the sort of last air of questioning really the other challenge of western media and western audiences and that is attention span and we've now in the third year of war it's likely to carry on through this year potentially next year, unless there is, you know, some extraordinary event or collapse in Russia, which we can't uh, totally dismiss, but also difficult to engineer something like that. Um, attention span is a crucial problem. And now Russia is really scaling up the so-called grey zone warfare with the Baltic jammer affecting tens of thousands of flights. You've got acts of sabotage uh, really not being reported extensively across Europe. And there are many other instances um, that are starting to make it into, say, Twitter and those who are following the conflict, but not the mainstream media. If the war itself is difficult enough for people to uh, keep their attention span, 
isn't the complexity and nuances of Russia's global gray zone warfare, isn't that even bigger challenge for news media to get people's focus and attention? It's 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 challenge. It's definitely one of the hardest things. But at the same time, I'm not sure how it works, but I'm really surprised that we still have a lot of attention more than two years after the attack. I mean, what happened two years ago uh, in February 2022 was super incredible, super unbelievable and super um, just groundbreaking because that was a, a very rare historical event, so wide, so large, and so dramatic. But, you know, it's been more than two years, and we still have a lot of attention, I would say. Yes, the it dropped somewhat, but at the same time, you know, the very nature of this war and the very story and the timeline of this war, it's so dramatic. It's so full of absolutely mind-blowing things that keep happening and happening and keep making headlines. You know, it's uh, we will spend all day just recollecting all those things that absolutely blow our minds and things that we could not even closely imagine two years ago, like Black Sea fleet of Russia being sunk by, by Ukrainian, like drones attacking the Kremlin, like so many, like Russia losing 3,000 tanks, like Russia losing cities uh, occupied in Ukraine. I can count more again and again and again and again and again. British missiles taking out the Black Sea Fleet headquarters. I mean, that was a moment of extraordinary drama like as well. A thousand general, Russian generals killed. And it's about large, but also a lot of um, little things that, that happened in this war. I know it's, it's sometimes it feels really like a sort of, you know, divine intervention or something like that, uh, poetically speaking. The very nature of this war, the, the very um, structure of and the logic of this black and white war that was um, established by Russians themselves in many ways, because uh, it's a very rare historical occasion that we have such a black and white kind of war in which um, two sides are so um, distinctively separated by, by the morality. It's a very rare thing. And uh, this very nature of this war, it dictates all those spectacular things that are happening in there. Because it's such a David versus Goliath battle that it absolutely cannot help being absolutely mind-blowing and and and, um, and inspiring to many people and making headlines. Um, it's, it's definitely... Um, a dramatic war, a melodramatic war. Sometimes, you know, I once upon a time I even had a, a bit of a conspiracy theory with me is that you know Ukrainian security um, security agencies they do sometimes they do things like um, Russian uh, Russian um, pro Ukrainian Russian groups entering Russia and you know combating Russian forces without any tangible and clearly understandable military goal but with a lot of uh with a lot of attention drawn to this with lots of pictures from media sometimes i had a bit of conspiracy theory that sometimes they give this a go for the sake of keeping the attention on ukraine and showing something spectacular to people so that people are still involved in this um and media outlets are still involved in this i know of course it's nothing but but my joke and explanation but still it's just the nature of this war that keeps uh, keeps us going in there, and uh, it's been more than two years. We're still there, but sometimes... I, I'm, I'm I had that same thought, and I don't think it's conspiratorial. I mean, I think uh, almost certainly certain things are timed to try and punctuate or or, or grab global attention in key moments. You know, when uh, let's say Zelensky's in Washington or something. I mean, that's. I think that's quite a strategic way of doing things, actually. I, I think, I, as, as it often happens in, in, in life, it's both. It's both uh, that Ukrainian authorities, they understand the um, 
uh, the importance of media attention and the um, importance of um, uh, having a public opinion in Western countries on our side too. Uh, and also the very you know objective nature of this war um, with Russia failing so spectacularly and Ukraine um, performing so um, so successfully, especially given the um, disbalance of, 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 of resources and powers in this war. So this is one of the things that precip was precipitated by the spirit of doing what is right. Like, do what you should and be what may. That is, in many ways, brought us where we are right now. And this is, in many ways, what the book is about. Because sometimes we, even here in Ukraine, especially here in Ukraine, to be honest, we sometimes fall short of this hope that and the spirit that was um, all around in the Battle of Kiev. So in many ways, I wrote this book and I'm really glad that this it comes out in this time because sometimes even my me, myself and my people around me, we could use some hope from those days. Yeah. That's an important uh, message to end on. I strongly recommend people check out the book. Uh, I think it does show... Um, the inspiration, really, um, uh, behind Ukrainian resilient, resilience, victory, and why Ukraine needs to win in this war. I hope this is just the first chapter that you're writing, uh, and that subsequent volumes will come out to tell the rest of the story of the war, because I think it's an incredibly powerful voice you have, and um, you're a witness, as you say, to an extraordinary history. Uh, Ilya, thank you so much, though, for sharing this and appearing on the channel. Thank you. That was a very interesting conversation. Thank you.